Hello everybody and this is uh, Narendra Kumar and we are from NRK Academy and today we have in our series Master Classic Stories uh, and Vocabulary Study of Great Authors. Uh, today we have Gaide Mopasa with That Crossly Ride and we'll be narrating the story here and we'll be doing the vocabulary study in the next video. Gaide Mopasa, That Crossly Ride. The household lived frugally with very less on the meager, very less income derived from the husband's insignificant, again very less appointments. Two children had been born of the marriage and the earlier condition of the strictest economy had become one of quiet, concealed, shamefaced, shameful misery. Misery means very poor conditions. The poverty of a noble family which in spite of misfortune, in spite of misfortune, never forgets its rank, you know, never forgets its rank. Hector de Grebelin had been educated in the provinces under the paternal roof by an aged priest. His people were not rich, but they managed to live up, live, managed to live and to keep up appearances. Keep up appearances means put up a show. At 20 years of age, they tried to find him a position and he entered the Ministry of Marine as a clerk at 60 pounds a year. He foundered on the rock of life. Foundered means failed, like all those, like all those. Which kind of people who have not been early prepared for its rude struggles, who look at life through a mist, who do not know how to protect protect themselves, whose special aptitudes and faculties, aptitudes and faculties, which means skills and intelligence, have not been developed from childhood, whose early training has not developed the rough energy needed for the battle of life, or furnished them, given them with tool or weapon. So he founded a founded on life because of that in life because of that. His first three years of office work were a martyrdom. Martyrdom means almost losing your life for your work. He had however renewed, made an acquaintance again, the acquaintance of a few friends of his family, elderly people far behind the times and poor like himself who lived in aristocratic streets. Aristocratic means noble. The aristocratic streets, the gloomy thoroughfares of Faubourg Saint Germain. There's a place and he had created a social circle for himself. Strangers to modern life, humble yet proud, yet proud. These needy aristocrats, needy, always needing something, lived in the upper stories of sleepy old world houses. From top to bottom of their dwellings, the te tenants were titled, tenants were titled, they had good titles, but money seemed just as scarce, as less on the ground floor as in the attics on the top floor. Their eternal prejudices, absorption in their rank, anxiety lest they should lose caste, lose their rank, filled the minds and thoughts of these families, once so brilliant, now ruined by the idleness of the men of the family. Ruined means spoiled complete. Hector de Grebelin met in this circle a young girl as well born and as pure, poor as himself and married her. They had two children in four years. For four years, more the husband and wife harassed by poverty, which means stressed by poverty, knew no other distraction, knew no other distraction, which means distraction means changing your mind, you know, having a break, knew no other distraction than the Sunday walk in the Champs Elysees and a few evenings at the theatre, amount, amounting in all to all to one or two in the course of the winter which they owed to free passes presented by some comrade or the or other but in the spring of the following year some overtime work was entrusted entrusted given to hector de grebelin by his chief for which he received the large sum of 300 francs the day he brought the money home he said to his wife my dear henrita we must indulge in some sort of festivity indulge means find pressure say an outing for the children and after a long discussion, it was decided that they should go and lunch one day in the country. Well, cried Rector, once will not break us, so we'll hire a wagonet for you, the children and the maid, and I'll have a saddle horse. The exercise will do me good. The whole week long, they talked of nothing but the projected excursion. Excursion means going out. Every evening on his return from the office, Hector caught up his elder son, put him astride, his leg and making him bounce up and down as hard as he could said that's how daddy will gallop next Sunday and the youngster amused himself all day long by bestriding chairs dragging them round the room and shouting this is daddy on horseback 
The servant herself gazed at her, uh, her master with awestruck eyes, awestruck, awestruck means little admiring eyes as she thought of him riding alongside the carriage and at meal times she listened with all her ears while he spoke of riding and recounted the exploits of his youth. Exploits, which was all the great things he did when he lived at home with his father. Oh, he had learned in a good school and once he felt his steed between his legs, steed means horse, he feared nothing, nothing whatever. Rubbing his hands, he repeated gaily, gaily means happily to his wife, if only they would give me a restive animal, I should be all the better pleased. You will see how well I can ride and if you like, we'll come back by the champs Elysees just as all the people are returning from the boys. As we shall make a good appearance, I shouldn't at all object to meeting some someone from the ministry. That is all that is necessary to ensure the respect of one's chiefs. So he wants the respect. On the day appointed, the carriage and the riding horse arrived at the same moment before the door. Hector went down immediately to examine his mount, mount means horse. He had had straps sewn to his trousers and flourished in his hand, flourished, you know, <coughs> shown off, showed off. Uh, in his hand a whip, whip means the, the crack by which you beat the horse. He had bought the evening before. He raised the horse's legs and felt them one after, the, after another, passed his hand over the animal's neck, flank and hocks, opened his mouth, examined his teeth, declared his age and then the whole household having collected round him, he delivered a discourse, a discourse, a lecture on the horse in general and the specimen before him in particular pronouncing the latter excellent in every respect. When the rest of the party had taken their seats in the carriage, he examined the saddle girth, the place where you keep your legs. Then putting his foot in the stirrup, he sprang to the saddle. The animal began to covet and nearly threw his rider, <laughs> threw his rider. Hector not altogether at his ease, not comfortable, at his ease means comfortable, tried to soothe him, to calm him down, the horse. Come, come, good horse, gently now. Then when the horse had recovered his equanimity, equanimity means calm, and the rider his nerve, which means his attention, the latter asked, are you ready? The occupants of the carriage replied with one voice, yes. Forward, he commanded, and the cavalcade set out. All looks were centered on him. He trotted in the English style, rising unnecessarily high in the saddle, looking at times as if he were mounting into space. Sometimes he seemed on the point of falling forward on the horse's mane. His eyes were fixed, his face drawn, his cheeks pale. No color. His wife holding one of the children on her knees and the servant who was carrying the other continually cried out, Look at Papa! Look at Papa! And the two boys intoxicated, means drunk by the motion of the carriage, by their delight and by the keen air, uttered shrill cries. High pitched cries. Shrill means high pitch. The horse, frightened by the noise they made, started off at a gallop. Started off means went, went very fast. At a gallop. Right. And while Hector was trying to control his steed, his horse, steed means horse, his hat fell off. And the driver had to get down and pick it up. When the equestrian, equestrian means horse rider had recovered it, he called to his wife from a distance. Don't let the children shout like that. They will make the horse bolt. Bolt means run. They lunched on the grass in the vicinate woods, having brought provisions with them in the carriage. Although the driver was looking after the three horses, Hector rose every minute to see if his own lacked anything. He patted him on the neck and fed him with bread, cakes and sugar. He's an unequal trotter, he declared. He certainly shook me up a little at first, but as you saw, I soon got used to it. He knows his master now and won't give any trouble, any more trouble. As had been decided, they returned by the champs Elysees. That spacious thoroughfare, a lot of space, spacious thoroughfare, literally swarmed with vehicles of every kind. And on the sidewalks, the pedestrians were so numerous, numerous means too many, that they looked like two indeterminate black ribbons unfurling their length, unfurling, coming out, length from the Arc de Triumph to the Place de la Concorde. A flood of sunlight played on this gay scene, gay means happy scene, making the varnish of the carriages, the steel of the harness and the handles of the carriage doors shine with dazzling brilliancy. An intoxication of life, drunk, intoxication is drunk, a drunken feeling, an intoxication of life 
and motion seem to have invaded this assemblage. So this whole intoxication, the joy had invaded, had come into this assemblage. All the people gathered there is called assemblage of human beings, carriages and horses. In the distance, the outlines of the obelisk could be discerned, could be discerned, discerned means seen in a cloud of golden vapor. As soon as Hector's horse had passed the Arc de Triumph, he became suddenly imbued, filled with fresh energy and realizing that his stable was not far off, began to trot rapidly fast through the maze of wheels despite all his rider's efforts to restrain him. So he started going very fast. The carriage was now far behind. When the horse arrived opposite the Palais de Industry, he saw a clear field before him and turning to the right, set off at a gallop. Set off at a gallop, very fast. An old woman wearing an apron was crossing the road in leisurely fashion, slowly. She happened to be just in Hector's way as he arrived on the scene, riding at full speed. Powerless to control his mount, mount his horse, he shouted at the top of his voice, Hi, look out there, hi! She must have been deaf, for she continued peacefully on her way until the awful, horrible, awful moment when, struck by the horse's chest as by a locomotive under full steam, she rolled 10 paces off, turning three somersaults, you know, turned around on her body on the way. Voices held, yelled, voices yelled, shouted, Stop him! Hector frantic with terror, frantic, panic, frantic means panic, very afraid, with terror, extreme fear, clung to the horse's mane and shouted, help, help. A terrible jolt hurled him, threw him off as if shot from a gun over his horse's ears and cast him into the arms of a policeman who was running up to stop him. In the space of a second, a furious gestic gesticulating is moving his hands and legs, vociferating group, vociferating, loudly shouting group had gathered around him. An old gentleman with a white moustache wearing a large round decoration seemed particularly exasperated, sick of him, he was exasperated, vexed with him. He repeated, confound it, when a man is as awkward as all that he should remain at home and not come killing people in the streets if he doesn't know how to handle a horse. Four men arrived on the scene carrying the old woman. She appeared to be dead. Her skin was like parchment, her cap on one side and she was covered with dust. Take her to the druggist, ordered the old gentleman and let us go to the commissary of police. Hector started on his way with a policeman on either side of him. A third was leading his horse. A crowd followed them and suddenly the wagonette appeared in sight. His wife alighted in consternation. Consternation is too many feelings. The servant lost her head, the children whimpered, which means cried. He explained that he would soon be at home, that he had knocked a woman down and that there was not much the matter. And his family, distracted with anxiety, distracted, their mind taken away with anxiety, with tension, went on their way. When they arrived before the commissary, the explanation took place in a few words. He gave his name, Hector de Gribelin, employed at the Ministry of Marine and then they awaited news of the injured woman. A policeman who had been sent to obtain information returned saying that she had recovered consciousness, she has come back to consciousness, but was complaining of frightful internal pain, frightful, frightful, very fearful internal pain. She was a charwoman, 65 years of age, named Madame Simon. When he heard that she was not dead, Hector regained hope and promised to defray her doctor's bill to pay her doctor's bill. Then he hastened to the druggist. The doorway was thronged. Thronged means full of people. The injured woman huddled, huddled, you know, her whole body in one place in an armchair was groaning, was crying of pain. Her arms hung at her sides. Her face was drawn. Two doctors were still engaged in examining her. No bones were broken, but they feared some internal lesion. Hector addressed her. Do you suffer much? Oh, yes. Where is the pain? I feel as if my stomach were on fire. A doctor approached. Are you the gentleman who caused the accident? I am. This woman ought to be sent to a home. I know one where they would take her at six francs a day. Would you like me to send her there? Hector was delighted at the idea, thanked him and returned home much relieved. Relieved, which means he, was, he had a lot of relief. Thank God. His wife, dissolved in tears, was awaiting him, was waiting for him. He reassured her said, it's okay. 
It's all right. This Madam uh, Miss uh, Simon is better already and will be quite well in two or three days. I have sent her to a home. It's all right. When he left his office the next day, he went to inquire for Madam Simon, and he found her eating rich soup with an air of great satisfaction. Well, said he. Oh, sir, she replied. I'm just the same. I feel sort of crushed. Not a bit better. Doctor declared they must wait and see. Some complication or other might arise. Hector waited three days. Then he returned. The old woman, fresh-faced and clear-eyed, began to whine, cry when she saw him. I can't move, sir. I can't move a bit. I shall be like this for the rest of my days. A shudder passed through Hector's frame. A shiver. He asked for the doctor, who merely shrugged his shoulders. He just moved his shoulders and said, "What can I do? I can't tell what's wrong with her. She shrieks, shouts, shrieks and shouts when they try to raise her." They can't even move her chair from one place to another without her uttering the most distressing cries. Distressing, you can't bear them. D cries, crying. I'm bound to believe what she tells me. I can't look into her inside. So long as I have no chance of seeing her walk, I'm not justified in supposing her to be telling lies about herself. The old woman listened, motionless, without moving. A malicious gleam in her eyes. Malicious means very evil, very bad gleam, light in her eyes. A week passed, then a fortnight, then a month. Madame Simon did not leave her armchair. She ate from morning to night, grew fat, chatted gaily, happily with the other patients and seemed to enjoy her immobility. Enjoy her immobility, which means can't move, as if it were the rest to which she was entitled after 50 years of going up and down stairs, of turning mattresses, of carrying coal from one story to, to another, which is one building to another, of sweeping and dusting. Hector at his wit's end, like he couldn't bear it anymore. Wit's end means you can't bear it anymore, you can't take it anymore. Hector at his wit's end came to see her every day. Every day he found her calm, calm and serene, declaring, I can't move, sir, I shall never be able to move again. Every evening, Madame de Griblin devoured with anxiety, devoured, which is consumed, you know, totally with anxiety, said, how is Madame Simon? And every time he replied with a resignation born of despair. Resignation means you accept it. Born of despair, can't do anything. Despair means you can't do anything. Just the same, no change, whatever. They dismissed the servant whose wages they could no longer afford. They economized more rigidly than ever. The whole of the extra pay had been swallowed up. Then Hector summoned four noted doctors, famous doctors, who met in consultation over the old woman. She let them examine her, feel her, sound her, watching them the while with a cunning eye. Cunning eye. We must make her walk, said one. But sirs, I can't, she cried. I can't move. Then they took hold of her, raised her and dragged her a short distance. But she slipped from the grasp and fell to the floor, groaning and giving vent. Groaning means crying and giving vent. Expressing, giving vent is expressing to such heart-rending cries, heart-rending, which means it will break your heart. Cries means crying that they carried her back to her seat. With infinite care and precaution, they pronounced a guarded opinion, agreeing. However, that work was an impossibility to her. She can't work. And when Hector brought this news to his wife, she sank on a chair murmuring, it would be better to bring her here, it would cost us less. He started in amazement. Start means like looked at her, shocked, in amazement. Here, in our own house, how can you think of such a thing? But she resigned now to anything. Resigned means accepted. Now to anything, replied with tears in her eyes. But what can we do, my love? It's not my fault. And that completes the story. So this is a very beautiful story of how a small mistake can lead to someone being, someone exploiting you. And your foolishness, there's much more to the story than can be explained. I'm sure you've got the essence of the story as a story. Thank you so much. We will meet again with another story and we'll be doing vocabulary study in the next video. Thank you.